There are certain areas of the brain that reorganize in the context of trauma. In a previous video, we explored the more abstract experience of trauma, with some reference to neurobiological changes. In this video, we'll examine those changes in more detail. The brain constantly monitors the environment for signs of threat. Monitoring of the internal environment is called interoception and is controlled predominantly by the insular cortex. Monitoring of the external environment is called exteroception and is controlled primarily by the basal nucleus of the stri terminalis, an extension of the amygdala. Sensorial signals are processed through these two pathways, initially synapsing onto the salience network. The salience network is the gatekeeper of sensorial information and has three outputs. First, it's the switch between the central executive network and the default mode network. The central executive network controls externally oriented action, whereas the default mode network controls internally oriented action. The default mode network has received a lot of attention lately and has become an area of potential transdiagnostic consideration as it has a lot to do, it turns out, with self-reference, self-concept, and self-organization. The default mode network is the system that becomes active when you're driving on autopilot, going through the motions. The central executive network becomes active with direct engagement and tasks in the present moment. In the context of trauma, activity in the central executive network lowers, and activity in the default mode network increases, resulting in detraction from the present moment. Secondly, the salience network also feeds back onto the hypothalamus at two key locations, the paraventricular network and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is the area of the brain that controls the sleep-wake cycle, the circadian rhythm, and is heavily involved in the normal ebb and flow of neurochemistry following a day and night pattern. The paraventricular network is a crucial location involved in moving a decidedly threat-oriented signal to other regions of the brain for mobilization. In the context of trauma, the salience network is overwhelmed by the sensorial input, and this high energy state is carried throughout the brain in subsequent interactions between regions. From the hypothalamus, once the signal is determined to be of threatening origin, there are several interactions that follow. Activity in the anterior cingulate cortex is decreased. The anterior cingulate cortex has several functions. It's involved in emotional regulation, cognitive control, and decision making. Attention and motivation, autonomic nervous system regulation, and both emotional and physical pain perception. The anterior cingulate cortex is a hub linking the limbic system, including the amygdala and hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex, making it crucial for integrating feelings, thoughts, and actions. In the prefrontal cortex, activity is decreased. There is a bottom-up hijacking because the system has determined that it's under threat and must mobilize more evolutionarily distant regions in order to ensure survival. This makes usual regulatory psychotherapeutic skills difficult to execute. In the limbic system, specifically focusing on the amygdala, activity is increased. This is a key location because of its involvement in fear and encoding memories. This is where the fear-charged sensorial fragments are generated, making up the implicit memory of trauma. Activity in the hippocampus is decreased. When the decreased activity of the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are combined, this is where we see a shutdown of narrative or explicit memory generation. As these interactions coalesce, the periaqueductal gray, or PAG, becomes activated. This is a midbrain structure that plays a central role in pain modulation, defensive behavior, and autonomic nervous system regulation. This system acts as a primitive integrator of survival-related behaviors, 
linking sensory input, especially threat and pain, with appropriate autonomic and behavioral reactions. Recent research has demonstrated a link between the periaqueductal gray and the default mode network, and is now thought to be involved in the establishment of identity or self-concept. It further increases activity in the default mode network, pulling the individual away from present moment and latching on to an identity. A few times I've referenced the autonomic nervous system and how a few of these networks influence it. This system governs the felt sense of emotion. Emotion is essentially energy in motion, and we experience emotion through feeling. What we are feeling is essentially the activities of the autonomic nervous system. Let's break it down. There are two main branches of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Let's look at these in evolutionary order, which corresponds with how they show up clinically. The ventral vagus, one of the two branches of the parasympathetic nervous system, is the social engagement system and has everything to do with connection and social interaction. It is the branch of the nervous system involved in co-regulation, the regulation of the nervous system through the assistance of another. This system was expanded upon mainly by the work of Stephen Porges and his polyvagal theory. This is the first system to become activated in the context of threat, is influenced by the attachment structure and early childhood development, and is the most evolutionarily recent, evolving around 200 million years ago. If we are able to activate our internal safe base to contain and metabolize a threat, then it will not be processed through the other branches of the autonomic nervous system. If the ventral vagal system is ineffective at containing the threat, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. The sympathetic nervous system is primarily involved in mobilization. It's commonly referred to as the system that produces the fight or flight reaction. Many individuals in this state feel restless, anxious, or irritable. These reactions aim to mobilize the body to move away or fight against the perceived threat. The sympathetic nervous system evolved around 400 million years ago. If the sympathetic nervous system is unable to mobilize the individual out of threat, the dorsal vagal system becomes activated. This most primitive branch of the autonomic nervous system evolved 500 million years ago. The dorsal vagal system is involved in immobilization, shutdown, freeze, and the dissociation responses. Many individuals in this state feel depressed, fatigued, and burnout. In the context of safety, meaning both the absence of threat and the presence of connection, this system is involved in the rest and digest functions of the body. To sustain all of this activity, The hypothalamus sends signals to the anterior pituitary, which in turn sends signals to the adrenal gland to synthesize cortisol. Cortisol is stress hormone, but is largely involved in mobilizing energy stores. This is necessary to maintain this heightened energy state. The activities of the autonomic nervous system interact with several systems outside the brain, Axes form with the adrenal gland, gonadotropin system, thyroid and metabolics, gut, and immune system, among others. This coalesces into dynamic interactions between the brain and the body, where the systems as a whole reorganize surrounding a survival-oriented state. This leads to several phenotypic expressions of trauma, owing to the diversity of the trauma response and the variety of multi-system outcomes such as metabolic disturbances, hormonal imbalances, micronutrient deficiencies, gut impairment, and immune dysregulation. These changes will become the topic of a future video. If this perspective resonates with you and you want to see more content, please like and subscribe. Help me spread awareness and contribute to a better, more compassionate mental health care system. To learn more, check out the additional videos and the links in the description below.